tonight is Yaron Brook. Yaron is the uh, former, very recently former, executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, currently a board member, and also has his own podcast called... The Yaron Brook Show. The Yaron Brook Show. Yeah. And uh, it's actually quite excellent. If you've not had a chance to, uh, to see it, I, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's lots of good, good content. And I'm really, really excited um, to be talking with Yaron. I have known of Yaron and followed Yaron for uh, quite a while, but uh, tonight's actually the first time I think we had a chance to meet in yep. person, and I've been, I've been really looking forward to this. So, Yaron, I think many people here, given that crypto and Puerto Rico seem to attract kind of a, uh, a maverick, independent, sort of uh, libertarian-minded folk from time to time. Uh, I imagine many folks here are somewhat familiar with, with Ayn Rand, but if you don't mind, just take a minute to describe and inform everybody about um, Ayn Rand, her work, her, her philosophy, and why she is so uh, still an important force in the world today. Sure. I am curious, though. Maybe we can see a show of hands, though, with these lights, I can't really see anything. Um, how many of you have read an Ayn Rand book? An, an Ayn Rand book? Okay, so quite a few have not. All right, so there's a good, good number who haven't. So Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand and I'll, I'll try to give a short biography, although I think her life story is quite interesting. It's kind of the epitome of the American dream. She was born in 1905 in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, as she was growing up, the Russian Revolution happened, so she got to experience communism firsthand. Uh, she she uh, witnessed the revolution, went to university under the kind of the, the regime of the communists, and discovered in her early 20s that if she stayed in the in Russia, they would kill her. She you know she she was not one that was particularly diplomatic. In her, uh, in her ideas and what she said, and she was clearly uh, antagonistic to communism, even at a very, very young age. So she, she got it very, very young that this was a bad system. So she managed to get out of the Soviet Union in the 20s uh, and, and come to the United States uh, with the excuse of going to do some research for a university project and uh, Stalin, uh, there was a little window of opportunity and she got out. Every, her family knew she'd never come back. She came to the U.S. Um, and, and went pretty much straight, she, pretty much straight to Hollywood. She wanted to be a writer. She went to Hollywood, first day in Hollywood, she is, uh, I don't know if you know this story, but she's, she goes to Cecil B. DeMille Studios. Now, you guys are too young to know who Cecil B. DeMille was, but he was like the Steven Spielberg of the time, of silent movies. And she goes to studios and she says, I want to be a writer with a thick, heavy accent, Russian accent. And they look at her like she's crazy. And she walks out and in the driveway, there is Cesar B. DeMille sitting in his big convertible. And she stares at him and he, and he says, why are you staring at me? And she tells him, I'm here from Russia and I want to be in the movies. I want to write. I just came from the Soviet Union. And he said, well, if you want to be in the movies, I'll show you what you need to do. So she... She says, get in the car. He takes her to the back lot where they're filming The King of Kings, the story of Jesus Christ, which is ironic if you know anything about Ayn Rand. <laughs> and she becomes an extra on the movie, and she learns that's her beginning in the film industry. She has dozens of different jobs in Hollywood after that. Ultimately, writes scripts. A number of them were produced into movies. Writes a play that is produced off-Broadway uh, in, in, in L.A., and uh, writes uh, a, a novel that is uh, not very successful, but, but is the beginning called We the Living, which many of you probably haven't read, and I encourage you, it's the most biographical of all of her books. Then she writes a book called The Fountainhead, which you might know more about. And The Fountainhead is rejected by 12 publishers. The 13th takes it. Doesn't print a lot of copies because it doesn't believe much in the book. And uh, through word of mouth, it becomes a New York Times best-selling book. And indeed, sells as many copies today as it did when it was a New York Times bestseller. And this is a book that was published in 1945. That's unheard of in publishing. There's no other author that has sold more copies after they're dead than she has. Uh, 1957, she published Atlas Shrugged. By this point, everybody wanted to publish it. Uh, and, uh, and it became an instant bestseller 
and to this day sells uh, in the six figures, translated into almost every language. There are probably only two major languages that it's not translated in. You can ask me later what those are. Uh, but every other language it's translated in, and it uh, sells all over the world. It was a bestseller recently in Ukraine. Um, it was a best-selling book in Ukraine in 2015, I think. Um, she then devoted her rest of her life to writing philosophy, writing commentary on the culture, commentary on the political world, commentary on ethics and, and philosophical issues in general. So her philosophy and like, uh, she died in 1982 uh, in, um, in, in New York City. So just uh, her philosophy on kind of a one leg. Uh, metaphysics is the, is the field of philosophy that studies what is, the nature of reality. Ayn Rand, what is, is. Reality is what it is. It's not shaped by your consciousness and it's not shaped by an external consciousness. So A is A, as Aristotle famously this said. This is the one thing I'm drawn about, by the way. But that's okay. Yeah, no God, none of this uh, other, <laughs> other consciousness is out there. It's just reality is what it is. Uh, no miracles. Um, you have the tool to know reality. It's called reason. You don't know about reality because of your emotions. You don't know reality through revelation. You, know, and you don't know reality by reading it in a book. You know about reality by use of your senses and your mind and your reasoning faculty. And only individuals can reason. Groups don't reason any more than groups can eat for you. They can't think for you. You have to think for yourself. And indeed, ultimately, you is all you have. And the purpose of your life is to be alive. It's to survive. It's to thrive. It's to be happy. So the moral purpose of every individual is his own happiness. So she's against sacrificing your life to other people. And she's against sacrificing other people to your life. Every individual is an end in himself dedicated to his own happiness. But how? Using his mind, by use of reason, the one tool we have to know reality. What kind of political system is appropriate for individuals who want to use their mind? in order to pursue their own happiness. What is the political system that leaves them free to do so? A political system that doesn't tell them what to think and what to do. Republic. Well, that political system is actually called capitalism. It's a political system that protects individual rights and leaves individuals free to pursue their own happiness, free of coercion, free of force, free of authority. And it, so it's, it's a free market where government is separate from economics and um, so she's against statism of all kinds. She's not right. She's not left. She rejects Biden. She rejects Trump and everybody in between and to their extremes. Uh, she would not fit in today's political map. She didn't fit in her own lifetime into the political map. She believed in actual freedom. Freedom of individu individuals. She agreed with some things with the left, some things with the right. Uh, but, but she was an individualist believing in limited government where the role of government is to protect rights, and that's it. And that's the introduction. Uh, that's excellent. Um, got chills at a couple points. Just, uh, it's, it's, if, you've not, if you've not read any of her stuff, you really ought to. Yeah, you should read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, those two novels. And if you're interested in more philosophical works, The Virtue of Selfishness, what a great title. Uh, the virtue of selfishness to partially to provoke you, hopefully into reading, and capitalism, the unknown ideal. So why capitalism is an ideal that we've never really experienced. We've never really had capitalism. You know, one of the more important things that, that she got right um, is the origins of value. Um, you know, one of the great most damaging ideas of the 20th century and really predates the 20th century but it became most manifest then is that value and wealth is a fixed commodity that it's something that exists out there uh, independent of humans and that therefore it can be seized and redistributed and divided up without destroying it like you can divide up a pizza like you can divide up a pie 
Um, and she really challenged that idea. She did it constantly in a number of different ways, but one of the most impactful for me was in a speech in Atlas Shrugged, Shrugged given by one of her characters in that, in that amazing book named Francisco D'Anconia. And in that speech, um, you know, what, I'm, what I really want to do now is, is just read a few quotes from this speech and invite you're on to really offer some feedback and commentary on it because uh, uh, the words kind of speak for themselves, but if you don't have the context of the book, they may not be completely um, hit home unless uh, you're on elaborates on them some. So in the, uh, in the book, Francisco is responding to a critic of money, a critic of wealth, a critic of Prosperity, somebody who uh, thinks the system is rigged and that we can seize and re redistribute wealth and, and that we do good when we do those things. And so he says, and I'm going to read a quote here from Francisco. He says, but you say that money is made by the strong at the expense of the weak, meaning that to get rich you have to take from others. What strength do you mean? It's not the strength of guns or muscles. Wealth is the product of man's capacity to think. So is money made by the man who invents a motor at the expense of the one who did not? Is money made by the intelligent at the expense of fools? By the able at the expense of the incompetent? By the ambitious at the expense of the lazy? Money is made before it can be looted or mooched, made by effort of every honest man, each to the extent of his ability. An honest man is one who knows that he can't consume more than he has produced. You want to elaborate on that quote a little bit? Share some thoughts? Sure. I mean, there's, there's a lot there, and, you know, we could, do, we could be for here for a long time. But, but think of it this way. Really, if you think about 300 years ago, think about life 300 years ago. Uh, most of us would be dead because the population of the earth was much, much smaller than it is today. Um, and yet, all of us would be working in the same field, pretty much. Um, we'd all be subsistence farming. We'd all be barely surviving. I would be dead because the life expectancy was 39. Your children, half of them would be dead because most kids didn't reach the age of 10. Um, and in a sense, life was a zero-sum game. There was only so much land that was cultivatable. Uh, people didn't have a life. You, you, you woke up in the morning, you want to work, you went back home, you ate something, and you want to sleep. That was it. Every single day. And if you didn't do that, you starved. Now, yes, some people lived in towns and some people had other professions. But they didn't choose those professions. Those professions were chosen for them by what their fa father happened to do. There was no freedom, and there was no wealth, and there was no time, and there was no luxury. There was, life was, according to Hobbes, life was short, brutish, and... Um, nasty, brutish, Nasty, and brutish, and short. And life was nasty, brutish, and short. That wasn't just him being, you know, a pessimist. That's what life was for most people, probably not for Hobbes, but for pretty much everybody else. And then comes a period. And, and by the way, this is true throughout all of his, human history. If we go back 100,000 years, life is nasty, brutish, and short. And yes, things get a little bit better under Greece, and maybe they get a little bit better under Rome, and then they descend back into really, really bad. And throughout the period, throughout this period of 100,000 years, an inconceivable number of years to to us who only live, maybe you guys will live maybe 100, 80, 100. Over those 100,000 years, the income of the average person in the world was about the same throughout the entire period. People earned about two bucks a day. 95 plus percent of the human population earned two dollars a day in today's dollars. So imagine what it would be like to live today under two dollars a day. That's what they did for 100,000 years. And the world was very much zero sum. And some people were wealthy. Why were they wealthy? Because they got to steal from other people. They were called aristocrats, right? And then something happened. This amazing thing happened in the end of the 18th century. And suddenly,
people started to become wealthier. Suddenly, we started to create wealth to add to the pie, although there isn't a pie for a variety of reasons, but to add to the stock of wealth. People started to live longer, live healthier. Children stopped dying. People started to have stuff. The population of the Earth exploded. Right? Today we have 8 billion people on planet Earth. In 1800, there were under half a billion. Right? We've grown that much, and we're like a gazillion times richer. We're not a little bit richer. We're not even 300 times richer, which is what the economics book tells you. That's absurd. We're at least a million times richer. I'll just give you one little example of how much richer you are than somebody 300 years ago, which you cannot measure. You can't put a dollar amount to it. You guys all have running water. 300 years ago, nobody had running water. Flushing toilets, how much is that worth to you in dollars? Some people here were here for Maria, so they get it. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> they, they lived without a flushing toilet for a few months. It wasn't fun. So we went from everybody poor. How many, how many in the world, world, not in the U.S., how many in the world live on $2 a day or less today? Anybody know? What, what's the percentage of the world population? 25%. 25% we have here. Anybody else? $2 a day. Less. This is based on UN numbers. So you can look it up online afterwards. Who? Anybody else? 25% going once? 24%. 15. <laughs> Anybody think it's more than 25%? We got a few more than 40. 40%. All right. The number of people who live on $2 a day or less today is under 8%. 8. You can look it up. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it was 30. Just over the last 40 years, about 2 billion people have come out of poverty, of an extreme poverty. Now, nobody knows this. That's one of the great sins of the modern culture we live in. How did that happen? Because we redistributed wealth because we stole it from some aliens that might have it in some other planet? It's because once you free up the human mind, once you give freedom to people, even a little bit of it, like they did in India, like they did in China, like they certainly did in South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore, even in Thailand. Once you give people a little bit of that freedom and they create businesses and they build businesses, they start creating wealth. And what is wealth? Wealth is what you get when you produce values, right? How do you, how do you become a billionaire? I'll, I'll, how do you become a billionaire? I mean, I don't know if there are any billionaires in the room. There might be. Bitcoin at 60,000, there might be a few billionaires here. How do you become a billionaire? Sell people what they're willing to pay for. Sell people something. Now you have to sell a lot of people, right? A lot of people. So you have to sell something to a lot of people for a price that exceeds what it costs you to produce. And you have to do it over and over and over again. Now, why are they willing to pay you more than it costs you to, produ you to produce? Why are they willing to pay you that much? Because it's worth more to them than what they're paying. So the only way, the only way to become wealthy is to enhance other people's lives. It's to provide value to others. And it's that value that the world captures. So somebody who's a billionaire is somebody who has created massive quantity of value in the world. Real value, value to human beings. And we know that because actual human beings have gone out, spent real money in order to buy the thing that this entrepreneur was selling. Why? Because they thought it would make their life better. And for the most part, nobody knows better how to make your life better than you. So, wealth creation is the creation of values in the world out there. And the wealth is just a reflection. The money is just a reflection of that values. So wealth is a virtue because it's a reflection of the fact that you've created a value. So sort of one of the very first ideas um, introduced in this speech is, is that wealth is created. It's, it's created. It's, it's manufactured by human ingenuity, by the human mind. And then the second key idea that's introduced really early in the speech is that it's creation 
doesn't deprive any other person of their wealth. Uh, in fact, as you just elaborated, you're on, it may enhance it because the reason they're willing to pay you now, is hey, because it, it's worth more it, to them it than they're paying for it. It does enhance it. I mean, there's no question it enhances I mean, there might be occasions where it doesn't enhance it. But for the most part, overwhelmingly, it enhances it. And that's how people get out of poverty, right? They gain out of poverty not because of foreign aid, not because of subsidies, not because of welfare. They came out of poverty because they got jobs. And who created those jobs? Entrepreneurs who are building things like this iPhone. Now, this iPhone is comprised of lots of little bits that are worthless unless they combine in a particular way to create the iPhone. That's what gives them value, the particular combination of all these components that are in here, all these raw materials that are in here. How do we know how to make an iPhone? It's not a product of physical labor. It's not a product of muscle. The product that, is the, that makes it possible to combine all these things to create the value that is an iPhone is the product of the human mind. Some mind had to figure out how to put all this together to get the result that is the iPhone and created something that didn't exist before and in that sense created wealth because I'm willing to pay $1,000 for this. And I'll tell you how much it's worth to me if you promise not to sell Apple. But this is worth tens of thousands of dollars to me. I mean, if I think about what this does, think about what you'd have to buy 20 years ago to do even a fraction of what this does. The camera, the film, the... Uh, the uh, Magnifying uh, glass, calculator... Flashlight. Flashlight. <laughs> not to mention computer. Not to mention an internet. Games. What's that? Music games, you'd have to buy, what do they call it, Walkman? You remember the Walkman? Yeah. They don't know what Walkman is, but a Walkman. Heart rate monitor. Yeah, I mean, it, there's no end. Heart rate monitor, yes, exercise tracker. There wasn't such a thing. But all this is in this thing. It's worth much more than $1,000 to me. It's enhanced my life. But you can't measure that. The, the closest thing we have to measure, how much this has enhanced human life, is the value, the market value of Apple. That's the closest thing. And the fact is, that the, the value that this has created in terms of human life is many multiples, many multiples of the market value of Apple. Because this is what, to me, many multiples of what I paid for it. No doubt. So another uh, idea that's introduced through uh, the quote I'm about to read to you, and remember when Francisco is giving this speech, he's giving it in response to, I believe it was a lady who had, uh, was critical of money, basically had said money is the root of all evil, and his speech is a defense of, of money. You can find the speech, by the way, a standalone, I think on the Ayn Institute website. It's called The Money Speech. And you can download just it. Mind-blowing speech. Um, he says, quote, money allows no power to prescribe the value of your effort except the voluntary choice of the man who is willing to trade you his effort in return. Money permits you to obtain your goods to obtain for your goods and your labor that which they are worth to the men who buy them, but no more. This is, this is a radical idea. It shouldn't be, but it really is because we're in an age where people think that, that experts uh, know better what the price of things should be, where, where we're told that sellers should be able to demand, we as should be able to demand for our art whatever we think it's worth rather than what the value thinks it's worth. And if we can't get what we think our art is worth, then somehow the system is rigged against us and uh, the government and, needs to step and in. The government needs to step in and fix it. Right, exactly. So it's actually uh, an ancient idea, right? In this sense. I mean if all one could argue that all of history, at least in the West, has been a battle between two philosophers. Aristotle and Plato. And this idea really goes back to Plato. Plato, in his Republic, basically argues that most people don't know what's good for them. Most people don't know what values they should pursue. And that what we need in life are philosopher kings who will tell us what a value should cost, in a sense, what values we should pursue, ultimately who we should marry, what job we should have. Every aspect of our lives should be ruled by philosopher kings. And, and for much of history, 
this has been true for much of history. Uh, to start a business, you needed permission from a king. Uh, to go on a voyage, you needed permission from a king. To get married, to get get married you needed permission of, of somebody, the lord, the local lord. Uh, to, to, to switch professions, you needed permission from somebody. For most of human history, we as individuals have not been free to make our own decisions. We've relied on the philosopher king. And Plato has a whole theory about why this is. The, the idea is that only the philosopher kings see true reality, the real essence of things, the real truth. We, we see the stuff that is called reality. It's nothing. It's, it's not real, real reality. Aristotle comes around and says, no, 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 no. We actually see reality. Reality is what it is. And you have the tool to know reality, your reason. So we don't need force for kings. Each one of you can make your own decisions for yourself. You can live your own life based on your own values. Trade to make your own life better. But that's, and that's the battle between those two forces. And of course, we're living over the last 250 years in the vict with the victory of Aristotle. But Plato's strong, and he keeps coming back. And, and uh, uh, these people you're quoting and, and the people that I think today run our intellectual and cultural lives are very much descendants of Plato, very much advocates of a platonic view of the world. They want to be our philosopher kings. They want to tell us how we should live, what we should do, how we should behave. They don't want you to be free. They don't want you as an individual to pursue your values, your happiness, your success. Uh, they want to run things for you. So, you know, the, there's a couple points in that quote, but one of them is, again, that ultimately value is in the mind of the buyers. It's, it's in a free system what people are willingly wanting to give in exchange for something. And we can fix prices, right? Sellers can dictate the price. Regulators can come in and dictate the price. And we all too often confound price and value, but they're two entirely different things. And the one thing that free market capitalism has going for it is that it tends to draw value and price into harmony. And when you have a system that's based on other than free market capitalism, namely a system based on coercion, you end up in situations where price and value uh, have a large spread and disaster is typically the result. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean this, these are basic principles of economics that in a free market supply matches demand. It doesn't mean that everybody gets what they want because wants is not the standard. Everybody gets what they value at the market price. If they're not willing to pay the market price, they don't get it. But then it wasn't worth it to them, right? And that's where value comes from. It doesn't, value is not a fantasy. Value is not a wish. Just wanting a Ferrari doesn't make it a value for you. A, a Ferrari is a value if you're willing to work hard and, and save the money and bring it all together to the point where you're willing, and you can, spend the kind of money that the market demands that you spend for a Ferrari. So value, only individuals can determine the value for themselves. Price is a market determinant. And then you get to decide whether you are willing to pay the price for your values or not. And if you're not, they're probably not their values. You're not, they're, they're probably not important values to you. So if, if wealth and value can be created by, by human ingenuity, um, it can also be destroyed in, to some degree by, by humans as well. And uh, Francisco, um, in the speech, gets into this. He says, quote, when a society establishes criminals by right and looters by law, men who use force to seize the wealth of disarmed victims, then money becomes its creator's avenger. Such looters believe it is safe to rob defenseless men once they pass the law to disarm them, but their loot becomes the magnet for other looters who get it from them as they got it. Then the race goes not to the ablest at production, but to the most ruthless at brutality. When force is the standard, the murderer wins over the pickpocket. And then that society vanishes in a spread of ruins and slaughter. Money is so noble a medium that it does not compete with guns and it does not make terms with brutality. It will not permit a country to survive as half property, half loot. And this is kind of the premise behind Atlas Shrugged, 
that um, make things difficult enough on those who are producing and creating wealth, and the wealth will either simply disappear or those people will simply disappear or both. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that in the world in which we live right now. I mean, many of us say here in Puerto Rico, in order to prevent the looting of our wealth, in order to prevent, you know, prevent the destruction of what we work hard to create. And, uh, you know, luckily there is this haven for Americans that is Puerto Rico that allows us to shield at least a, a significant portion of that wealth from those looters and those destroyers. But the world keeps going. And, and uh, what's interesting is Ayn Rand did not consider, and I don't consider, the world in which we live today a capitalist world. America is not capitalist. It is a mixed economy. There's elements of capitalism. We have some freedoms. You can do some stuff uh, free of regulations and control, but not much. Uh, people think they're private property, but just try not paying your property taxes one year and see how much the property belongs to you or whether you've actually been renting it from the government. Uh, property taxes are just rent that you pay for the government to use their property. Uh, and we live in this mixed world of heavy, heavy controls and force and regulations and some semblance of private property and some semblance of freedom. And Rand claimed that that is not a stable equilibrium. That either moves towards freedom or moves towards more and more and more controls and more and more looting. And I think we're seeing, particularly in the United States, but I think in Europe and even now in China, we're seeing the movement away from freedom towards more and more and more coercion, more and more and more regulation. It's not staying put. It's not staying where it is. It's getting worse. And it's going to get worse unless we make it better. And since there's almost no force in America today to make things better, it's just getting worse from one administration to the next. And it's not just politi politics. It's now the moral expectation. I, you know, I saw this, I don't know if you saw these tweets that are going on between Amazon and Elizabeth Warren uh, the last few days. It's, it's quite interesting. So Elizabeth Warren, uh, so Am Elizabeth Warren complained about Amazon and paying taxes. Amazon put out this tweet saying, you know, we follow the law. If, if you guys, politicians, write loopholes, we're going to take the loopholes. We're going we're gonna to deduct the stuff, but we follow the law and we pay taxes. So Elizabeth Warren wrote this, email, this tweet saying, basically, who are you to take such a snotty tone with a United States senator? I am going to work to break Amazon up so that you can't talk like this to a U.S. senator. Now, that's one of the most disgusting things a politician has ever said, although it sounds a little bit like Trump um, and what he said to Amazon uh, when, when he didn't like what the Washington Post was printing, which is also owned by, um, by Bezos. But that's the state in which we're in. Freedom of speech doesn't matter anymore. If you offend a politician who is now God, they used to be our servants. That's how the Constitution was written. They're supposed to serve us. Now there are gods. You can't offend them. And if you offend them, then they strike out and they'll break you up or they'll increase your taxes or they'll uh, force something down your throat because they are now lords and masters over all of us. And that's the world that we're heading towards unless we reverse course. That's the world from before this dramatic increase in wealth that we've experienced over the last 250 years. That's the pre-freedom world. And, and, and I think what Ayn Rand is warning us against is that, you know, why is it right morally? Why is it right economically to take money away from Amazon of Jeff Bezos and give it to other people? Why is that right? If Amazon got that money by Jeff, tweet, Jeff doesn't need it. He does. He absolutely needs it because he needs to go to Mars. And to go to Mars, he's going to need every last billion that he has. I mean, and it's his. And since when do we decide stuff based on need? You remember the communist slogan? The communist slogan is from each, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. But we're not communists. So it doesn't matter whether you need it or not. That shouldn't be the criteria by which you get stuff. It's a question of what you've earned. Some people earn a lot. Some people earn a little. 
Who cares? Inequality doesn't matter as long as it's earned inequality. It's not cursed inequality. It's not stolen inequality. It's not manipulated inequality. As long as it's earned, who cares? So we are heading towards a society of need where somebody's need is a claim against you. Somebody's need, you have to fulfill it. It's up to you. It's your job. You have more than that other person. So you have to provide for them. But that's the philosophy that this speech is arguing against. That's the philosophy Ayn Rand is against. You want to help another human being? Cool. Nobody's against helping other people. But that's a choice. You get to decide based on your values, based on what you want to do with your money right now. Jeff Bezos wants to go to Mars. I hope he succeeds because my children and grandchildren might be able to escape this planet, <laughs> maybe in time. But it's his choices what he does with his money. Money he created. Wealth he created. Not took from me. Amazon doesn't take from me. I use Amazon. Why? Because I gain value from it. I wouldn't buy from them if I didn't gain value from it. Now, I wish they'd ship more stuff to Puerto Rico. I have to say that, but you know, <laughs> that's a different issue. <clears throat> Maybe if we got rid of the Jones Act, they would. There's, a, there's something. Yeah, they, that's something you should be fighting for. Amen to that. Uh, and toward the end of the speech, he, he makes the point, or Aim Rand makes the point through Francisco Danconio that um, you know, what, we're, what we're dealing with here really is two alternative, competing, somewhat irreconcilable ways of resolving value conflicts. You know, humans value different things, and they value different things at different levels and to a different degrees. And what do you do when uh, those values conflict? What do you do when what I value uh, isn't just different than what you value, it's the opposite of what you value? Uh, how does that get resolved? And in the speech, let me get to the quote here, because it's a great quote, and then I'll invite you on to, uh, to, to talk about it. Francisco says, quote, unless and in, until and unless you discover that money is the root of all good, you ask for your own destruction. When money ceases to be the tool by which men deal with one another, then men become the tools of men. Blood, whips, and guns, or dollars, take your choice, there is no other, and your time is running out. There's basically only two ways to gain a value. To trade for it, or to steal it. To trade for it or to steal it. There's no other way to do it. Now you could hire somebody else to do the stealing for you. Call that somebody else the government. And pretend that because we voted on it democratically it's not stealing. But at the end of the day, if you want my money, you can either offer me something in return for that money, labor or good. Or you can come and stick your hand in my pocket and take it from me at the point of a gun. Now, as it turns out, we've become really sophisticated at stealing each other's money. We form little groups, call them gangs, and we go and use those gangs and take them to the voting booth. And we lobby our politicians and we bribe them and we get them a lot of votes and we get them to go and stick their hands or they hire people to go stick somebody's hands into our pockets and give it to the gang that won the election. But all politics is today is gang warfare. It's, it, that's what lobbyists are. That's what unions today are, unfortunately. That's what uh, all the different factions within are. That's what all these different groups who, who are at, at the, at, you know, going to the government and asking for this favor, or that favor, or this benefit, or that benefit. They're all just gangs trying to manipulate the process so they can steal whatever wealth, whatever values other people have for their own benefit. And that's the only alternative. It's the only alternative to freedom. A system where force is banned, where you cannot steal. You'd think this is obvious. Stealing is bad. Stealing is evil. And where the only way to interact with one another is through trade. It's through offering value for value. 
And this is where I think the topic turns to something that would be particularly relevant to the group here today, which is um, the money and, and the way that what we today call money really isn't money and, um, and how the powers that be are manipulating the money in ways that, uh, that do great harm. Uh, Francisco says, quote, when destroyers appear among men, they start by destroying money. For money is men's protection and base of moral existence. Destroyers seize gold and leave it to the owners and leave to the owners a counterfeit pile of paper. This kills all objective standards and delivers men into the arbitrary power of an arbitrary setter of values. Gold was an objective value, an equivalent of wealth produced. Paper, by contrast, is a mortgage on wealth that does not exist, backed by a gun aimed at those who are expected to produce it. Paper is a check drawn by legal looters upon an account which is not theirs, and that account being the virtue of uh, the victims that are robbed. Can you talk a little bit about gold as money, the, sure. what is in money, and the difference between money and currency, and kind of where we stand today? Yeah, I mean, you have to think about all transactions, all transactions in the economy, a fundamentally barter. Barter is where I provide goods and you provide goods and we exchange them. And barter is really, really inefficient. I mean, it's obvious it's inefficient. Uh, you know, because I, you know, I want, I, I might want eggs and you might have a cow and I might have chickens and somebody else has a pig and to get all this organized in a, in, in a way that everybody actually has what they want is really difficult. It's partially difficult because it's hard to get half a cow. Half a cow is not, is not worth half a cow. It's worth a lot less. Um, I mean, there's a lot of complications with barter, but for a long time, human beings survived through a barter system. They figured out how to exchange good for goods. But then somebody came up with the idea, what if we had one medium of exchange, call it, one unit of value that we used to value everything else that served to make more efficient this barter system? Because it's still true that at the end of the day, what I want is not money. What I want is the cow and the eggs and the, and the chicken and the things that I can do stuff with, right? Money facilitates the barter it makes barter more efficient and effective right and people have tried lots of different things they tried shells they tried rocks of particular shapes they tried tobacco in uh in uh, early america tobacco was money for a while but it seems that almost every civilization no matter where you go around the world typically settled on two mediums of exchange things that would facilitate this exchange of value for value effectively and the two were silver and gold and ultimately in more developed economies silver was dropped and gold became money and the reason gold became money is one is that gold is as limited supply and that supply is not just ac accessible to some ruler who can just print stuff up and start distributing it to his favorite people Right? Gold it requires mining, it requires real effort, it requires real activity to produce it. Right? So it's, 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 it's limited supply, and all the gold that's ever existed is still in the hands of people. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of ideal material to serve as money. It's also easily divisible. Right? You, can, you can make coins out of it, which was really important originally. Um, and it's, um, it's easy to weigh. There are a lot of good things about gold that make it an easy medium of exchange and easy money, right? But in addition to that, gold also has value beyond its value as a currency, as a medium of exchange. And you could argue about why, where the source of the value of gold is, but I would say the source of the value of gold is that it's pretty you know, what, what did people use gold for before money? They used it for jewelry. People like it. It's shiny. And amazingly, again, this is just a, an, an interesting psychological thing. No matter what culture you go among human beings, no matter where you go, no matter what period of time, people have always liked gold. They've always valued it. Crowns were always made of gold where there was gold available. So gold became money because it was valuable. 
people liked it, people wanted it in and of itself. And then, because it was a very efficient and effective means of exchange, it was easy to denominate everything. And with regard to paper money, I'd say when paper money was backed by gold, every, pa every, every piece of paper was exchangeable into a gold, into a unit of gold. So you know what, where the word dollar comes from? But you know what the word dollar means? It's a measure of weight. It's a measure of weight. So one dollar meant, uh, I can't remember, an eighth of an ounce of gold or something like that, right? So every dollar, a what? One thirty-fifth or something. I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's some unit of gold. Because dollars meant nothing other than in the context of a piece of gold, right? And indeed, in the, before the Federal Reserve was established in 1914, U.S. banks would print dollar bills. They would print the money. It wasn't a treasury. It wasn't, there was no Fed. The money was printed by banks and was exchangeable at the bank for gold. You could go into a bank with a bag of, gold, of, of dollar, with a bunch of dollar bills and ask for gold in exchange, and they would give it to you. And that was real money. That was actual money. The paper was called a money substitute because it represented a piece of gold. What we have today, what we've had since 1914, is money printed by government, backed by nothing. You can't take your dollar bills to the Federal Reserve and get anything other than the government bonds for it. Uh, it means nothing, but it serves as a medium of exchange. And it serves as a medium of exchange because the government basically said it does. We have legal tender laws. Uh, you, you know, if, if, if debt is in dollars, you have to be able to settle it in paper money, in, in government dollars. Government will take dollars as ta tax for taxes. It's become like money. But the funny thing about our currency today is you can print as much, more, um, as much of it as you want. So, for example, we just had uh, the government pass a $1.8 trillion stimulus package. Now, where are they going to get the $1.8 trillion from? Well, basically, they're going to print them. Now, we don't print money anymore. We create it digitally, and we put it on people's balance sheets. And it's just an entry that says somebody has $1.8 trillion. But it's out of thin air. It's out of nowhere. And, of course, if there's more of something than there was before, what happens to the value of what was there before? It goes down. So even though we don't see it in the change in prices... The fact is that the value of the dollars in your pocket is less than what it was before the $1.8 trillion stimulus plan. And that's $1.8 trillion on top of three point something trillion the Trump passed. So we're, we're five, six trillion dollars into the hole since COVID started. Money made out of thin air with no basis, no production, no wealth creation. None of this, what Francisco talked about. No value, Nothing created. no value was ever given for that money. Nothing was given for that money except that you can take it and use it to buy stuff. But the money has become meaningless. And I think people's attitude towards money, part of what Francisco's rebelling against, is, well, money's just stuff that the government prints. It doesn't reflect creation. So if Jeff Bezos has a lot of it, he must be in with the government. He must have somehow siphoned off a bunch of that money from other people. Right? Something he created, because there's no conception anymore, like there was with gold. If I have a lot of the gold, it means I've sold you a lot of stuff. You have the stuff, I have the gold. Today, none of that, there's no conception of that, because money is just made out of thin air by the government whenever they feel like it. We're about to print another three trillion in infrastructure bill that Biden is going to propose. Three trillion infrastructure. There's no end to this. They could print and print and print and print. And we know that at some point, this creates uh, price inflation, monetary inflation, where prices go up out of control. We've seen that in country after country after country. It hasn't happened yet in the United States. I think the, the damage that the inflating the money supply has is manifest in other ways rather than in rising prices, but damage is being done uh, on a massive scale. You know, my, my preferred way of sort of conceptualizing money, um, maybe I just find it personally gratifying, but I also find it, 
in many ways true, is real money is essentially a thank you note. Um, when you go and you get a haircut from the barber, you're giving them, if it's real money, a token of your gratitude. And if that token is sufficiently scarce and can't be counterfeited, and if enough people in a given area all begin to accept the same sort of token as a representation of their gratitude, uh, that token ultimately becomes money. And, and gold was an ideal token of gratitude in that regard because it was scarce, it was divisible, it was relatively easily transportable. It had a number of other characteristics and, and it wasn't counterfeitable. Yeah, you could go get more, you could go find more, but man, you would have to work your ass off digging in a gold mine to, to counterfeit <laughs> more uh, thank you notes, right? In, in today's system, that is uh, obviously not the case. We can manufacture these thank you notes out of thin air, and, and they're fraudulent. They are, they are uh, supposed tokens of gratitude for which no actual value was ever given by, by anybody. And that is um, offensive, I think, at, at so many levels. You know, Bitcoin has been often called gold 2.0 or digital gold. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin is actually more scarce than gold, more easily and cheaply transferable peer to peer than gold, more easily auditable than gold. It's literally impossible to counterfeit a Bitcoin. It's not impossible, though it is difficult to counterfeit gold more easily divisible than gold, and maybe most importantly, more easily made seizure-proof than gold. And when you combine that type of token of gratitude, that type of money with smart contracts running on blockchains that allow people to trade in that token in ways that uh, can't not be easily censored, easily suppressed, easily reversed, I think you perhaps have a very real um, opportunity to bring back uh, real capitalism in the world, if, if only at least initially in the virtual world, though increasingly uh, the world is being dominated and increasingly digitized, more and more is moving into that platform. And as the virtual world has real money and the physical world doesn't, I think we'll see that trend toward virtualization, toward digitalization, toward um, moving everything on chain, accelerate. So I'm going to uh, ask Yaron to just offer some thoughts on his thoughts on Bitcoin as money. Based on a comment that he made just a second ago, I, I want to anticipate what, uh, what might be one of his objections. If it's not, it's certainly a common objection. And that is that gold, for example, as Yaron emphasized, had uh, a use case other than money. It had a use case um, as jewelry, as something that was lovely and pretty and valuable. And humans valued it for that reason, perhaps, before they ever began to use it as a token of gratitude. I think there's a very big misconception and a very big divide between technologists who really get Bitcoin and blockchain and folks who come from more of an economics and finance background. And this question, I think, is probably one of the, the, the root of that division. I think folks who primarily come from an economics uh, bent, from a finance bent, uh, don't appreciate the extent to which a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin does actually have very real, very important use value that's completely independent and completely separate from its usefulness as as money, as currency. Many here in the room probably get that because many here are uh, from a technical background, but essentially the Bitcoin network is the world's largest and most secure digital ledger at this point. And it is a digital ledger that nobody can make an entry in unless they have uh, signing authority. And there are many useful reasons to make entries in that digital ledger. Satoshi Nakamoto, the very first transaction in the Bitcoin network, included a political statement 
it was a reference to a headline in the Times of London newspaper objecting to the money printing that Iran just described, objecting to the bailouts. That sort of uh, freedom of speech has real human use value to be able to speak in a way that cannot be su suppressed, cannot be censored, can be done anonymously or pseudo-anonymously. And to do that on the world's most secure, incorruptible blockchain, you actually have to have signing authority. And that's what the Bitcoin tokens essentially are. They are signing authority that allows you to make an entry into that extremely secure uh, digital ledger. And so uh, I do think that a lot of folks from an economics and finance background miss that subtle point that there is in fact a use for Bitcoin that goes well beyond its use as, as money or merely as a, as a digital token. Care to elaborate on any thoughts on that? Your sure. I mean, I, I'm not from a technology background. So um, I, I have some skepticism, but I don't know enough. So, you know, anything I say about this topic is, is somewhat delimited by the fact that I'm not an expert on this field. Um, but here's, here's some of the sources of my skepticism. Uh, that while gold is pretty to everybody, pretty much, you have to have this specialized knowledge to know that Bitcoin is valuable beyond its means of exchange. Now, it could be that in 50 years, everybody will get it because everybody will have that knowledge. So it could be that there will be a day in which everybody gets this value that I don't quite understand and that you guys seem to. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's possible. I, I, I just don't know. Um, I'll also say that, you know, one of the challenges with Bitcoin is that, yes, you can't replicate Bitcoin, but you can create other cryptocurrencies. You can create other cryptos, and you could create other blockchains, and you could create other ledgers. And in that sense, again, as an economist, it strikes me that you're creating inflation by doing that, a potential for inflation, that you've got now more money, right? Because all these different, so it's not just... Bitcoin is capped, right? There's only so much Bitcoin there will ever be in the world. But other, you could create infinite number of blockchains. So you can create an infinite number of Bitcoin-like instruments. Sure. That's not capped. Sure. So that, to me, seems inflationary. So I wonder about that. But I think my biggest source of skepticism is this idea that you can somehow bring about a private currency into the world and, no, and everybody's going to let you do it. I think you underestimate the power of physical force. The evil of governments. The evil of authoritarians. There's already a hand. China banned it. How'd that work out? <laughs> well, it worked out in a way that... Let, let me... I get it. China banned it. But, of course, it worked out. China banning it is... Is hurt your cause because the fact is that um, retailers in China don't accept Bitcoin if you want to buy stuff at the retail store they don't accept it which means that the rate of adoption in China is going to be a lot lower than it would have been if Bitcoin was legal in China and if in the United States they ban the Bitcoin and China bans Bitcoin and India bans Bitcoin yes all of you will still have your Bitcoins but you won't be able to do anything with them because anybody who accepts Bitcoin in exchange for a good will go to jail. There is a transaction there that is not anonymous. It's not hidden. It's physical because at the end of the day, you need an iPhone. So if, if you're going to buy an iPhone, I have to deliver an iPhone for you. But if the government says you cannot deliver an iPhone in exchange for Bitcoin, then Bitcoin becomes useless. So I think you underestimate the power of government. Now, I think it's an evil power. So you don't, I'm not defending their power to do this. I think at the end of the day that there's no way to shortcut a way to freedom. Freedom is not going to be achieved through technology. It's not going to be achieved through Bitcoin. It's not going to be achieved through crypto. Freedom needs to be achieved by changing people's ideas by changing a philosophy, by fighting for liberty and freedom. Uh, and once we have freedom, once we have laissez-faire capitalism in the world, would Bitcoin be the currency? I don't know, but I don't care. 
Because in a world like that, there'll be competition. Different entities will produce different private currency. And we'll see who wins. The best currency will win. I have no, I have no vested interest one way or the other in who we, I happen to think it'll be some electronic reflection of gold, transferable into gold, because you won't have to hide it, right? The, the, the anonymity won't be that important because you won't have an ominous government looking over your shoulder. So I think having a physical ma manifestation of gold backing up the crypto would be a value. But I don't know, and I don't really care. The point is, I care about liberty. I care about freedom. I don't care. I, you know, money's just, just a means. Let me uh, push back on a, a couple sure. of those, if I could. Uh, the first one is with regard to inflation. Um, yes, anybody can go fork Bitcoin. Anybody can go create an entirely new uh, digital token. But there is this well-known, highly, highly documented, highly studied phenomenon called network effects, yep. which is the idea that the more uh, users in a network, the more exponentially valuable that network Absolutely. becomes, which then attracts more users, which makes it even more exponentially valuable. We see this with phone networks. We see this with Facebook. Any of us could go and create Facebook 2.0. Uh, we could do it with a relatively modest amount of money. It's all software and code. It's not that hard. Um, but the odds that we're going to convince many of our family and friends to adopt Seanbook rather than Facebook are pretty slim and none because everybody's on Facebook. Yeah, there are some other competing social networks and they have gotten some traction, but has it really diminished Facebook's overall value proposition um, or usefulness? Uh, you know, uh, not much. Can and I so, just address that one? Please and then we'll do, go yeah. to that. I mean, uh, is anybody willing to take a bet here that Facebook is not the dominant social media platform in 20 years? Yeah, we, I mean, I'll take the bet that it's not. Uh, if you guys think it is, that's fine. I'll take that bet. Um, uh, Microsoft was, used to be the largest corporation in the world, had network effects all over the place. Apple succeeded, not partially with the help of the U.S. government by, by going after... Uh, after Microsoft's but, still the, what, second or third most... Yeah, but for a long time it wasn't. It, it had to re recreate itself. It had to reestablish those networks. Network effects are real. They're, they're incredibly powerful. They're incredibly valuable. And they can be overrun by another network. And they have been. We, we see that over and over and over again in the history, particularly in technology. So, uh, yeah, great. I mean, maybe Bitcoin is the network... And it's the final network, and there is no other network. I'm just not convinced. I don't know enough about it, but it strikes me as an economist that they're going to be competitors, and, and I wouldn't bet at all just on one, right? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure of that. Plus, let me add this. If, if, there's, if, if other networks are established, they don't, one network doesn't overrule other networks in the same way as, as with Facebook, right? Facebook, there's only so much time in the day you can't be on five different social networks. But you can accept five different currencies. And indeed, I think in the, in the ideal world, right, in laissez capitalism, there will be multiple currencies and, and people, they'll, be, they'll compete and there'll be multiple networks. But the network isn't exclusive, right? So you can have Bitcoin, I can have a store and I can accept Bitcoin and five other cryptocurrencies. No, I, but you I, see, that creates a problem yeah. because then what is the value? And, and this is the bottom line for me, and, and this has nothing to do with you guys. I just don't know how to value it. I'm a finance guy. So I need, I need, a, 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 I need a, 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 an anchor to, to put a value on it. Now, if you're saying it's going to replace all dollars in the economy, then I know how to value it. I, there, there are going to be 21 million units of Bitcoin. There's X trillions of dollars in the economy. I divide one by the other. That's the value of Bitcoin. If it replaces every dollar, but is it going to? And are there going to be other cryptos? And is the dollar, because it's backed by government and because government is nasty, is it going to survive somehow? I don't know what the price is. Is 60,000? Is it a million? Is it five? I have no clue. That's my challenge. Yeah. Well, there are ways of valuing it. There's, there's Metcalf's Law. There's the in-log-in variation of Metcalf's Law. And there is, more recently, the stock-to-flow model and the stock to flow cross asset sure. model uh, which has proven insanely accurate to date um, we'll see if it continues to to prove out um, but my goal is uh, now that i've met you're on in person to have him back here in a year in which case he's going to be a raving bitcoin fanatic so we'll see how <laughs> successful i am but the biggest thing i wanted to challenge yep. was Euron's comment that um that technology doesn't create freedom i could not disagree more in fact, I would say that uh, 
every single significant advance in human freedom was uh, preceded by a massive advance in technology. Uh, from uh, the printing press to double entry bookkeeping, the printing press led to the Protestant Reformation, which led to ultimately the Enlightenment, which led to ultimately where we are today. Um, technology, I think, is incredibly important in advancing the cause of human freedom. In fact, I, I think it is the, the very cause of human freedom. So um, just your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, double entry bookkeeping was invented in the Muslim world. Um, the Muslim world then became a lot less free than it had been when it invented double entry bookkeeping. Uh, the printing press, yes, ultimately led to freedom, but for a while led to, you know, Calvin's dictatorship in Switzerland, not a very nice or a good place. And we today have a ton of technology. I mean, uh, the, the invention of the microchip coincides with the growth of government. Um, the invention of the, the internet coincides with the growth of government. So uh, I think cause and effect are reverse here. Freedom leads to increases in technology. And as freedom is diminished, increases in technology are ultimately diminished. And, uh, you know, there was amazing technology in Rome. I mean, amazing technology in Rome. Um, technology that was lost for a thousand years. We, could, we didn't know how to build a dome like the dome in the Colosseum. We didn't know how to build multi-story buildings. We didn't know how to have running water with faucets. They did have that in Rome. Uh, you can see it in Pompeii. So, to me, the cause of relationship is the other way around. The, the reason Gutenberg actually ultimately can uh, not only invent the press, but can use the press, is because Europe starting to free up. The printing press, in a sense, existed in China even before that, but it was so oppressive, it didn't have any impact. Um, freedom creates technology, not the other way around. And if we rely on technology, and what really creates freedom are ideas, philosophy. Uh, that's where the focus should be in. If we, if we focus on the technology, then I fear that we ignore what really matters, the battle and the war that really matters, and one day we won't have either, freedom or technology. Fair enough. I think we've gone long enough. we got time for maybe, you got time for one or two questions? As many as they maybe want. Maybe one or two questions. Uh, anybody got anything? Let me give you that microphone here. I just want to say I totally agree with what he was saying uh, about relying too much on technology because, I mean, a lot of people, my last bad year camp here was in 98. Hold it a little closer. Now? Yeah. Okay. So back in Georgia, so I was 12 years old. Um, when Maria came, I was in my 30s, and I started living a lot of things, and every time I went to any place, every, everything was relying on electricity. So we depend on computers, we depend on all these things that as soon as electricity goes, you're done. 20, 30, 50 years ago, everything was on pen and paper. So we didn't have computers and it was slower, but if you went to get help, they had everything there, physically, on pen and paper. But now, like everything, oh, we don't have system, we don't have electricity, it's all this, you're done, you have to wait. Yeah, but you have to ask why we don't have electricity, right? Because, the, I mean, that's a, that's a massive failure, massive yeah. failure. Especially here, like... Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why Maria should have caused as much damage as it did to Puerto Rico. It is, it is the fault of the Puerto Rican government, it is the fault of the, fault of the Puerto Rican people for electing these bastards into again, government. And again, and again, and after yeah. you remove a guy... But it, but it doesn't matter, the people you replace them with are the same quality. So it's, again, a problem of ideas. It's, it's not a problem of technology. And look, here's, here's yeah, one other aspect. One little problem I have with Bitcoin, and it's not a big problem, it's just, it's just why I have some gold coins, and I think everybody should have a few gold coins, even though you have some Bitcoin, even though you heavily invest in Bitcoin. That is, when the electricity goes out, your Bitcoins are worth exactly zero. Exactly zero. And when the riots in the streets, and people are struggling, and they're trying to fight food, and civilization is breaking down, Nobody will care one iota about all your Bitcoin wealth. But if you have a few shiny gold coins, they'll trade food and weapons for them. I and that's a value. Totally agree with that, <laughs> no doubt. Any, anything else? Now let's hope we don't get there. I'd rather 
see you guys all get super rich off of Bitcoin. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming out. It's been awesome. Sure. Um, question then, and I fully agree with uh, Love and I fully agree with so I'm going to uh, ask like a skeptic's question. It's not necessarily what I believe, but I think it's relevant, especially because there's a lot of people in Puerto Rico that think this way. The idea that socialism is a big part of how humans interact. We are a social species. We're not purely individualistic. You know, if you look back in the history of the, the Homo sapiens, there's a lot of social, tribal, connected ways that we interact. And like when I look at my family, I look at the communities I'm part of, there's a lot of kind of traditionally socialistic ways that we interact. We don't say, thank you, wife, that was great intimacy. How much do I owe you? Thank you for that meal and cooking dinner for my kids. How much do I owe you? We don't interact purely capitalistically in a lot of our day-to-day -day interactions. And I wanted to kind of balance that against the criticisms that Ayn Rand often gets as being this hardcore individualist who doesn't actually understand the human species being a collective species in some ways. And how do we, and that's why Sean recommended a great book, uh, you know, Purchase Zero Marginal Cost Society, talks about the shared collaborative commons. Is there, is there a merger of something coming that's not purely capitalistic, as you said, that we've never actually seen, maybe because our species will reject it, and isn't you know destructive socialism that we see all too often? Is there something in between that can interact as a social species but not kill the individual? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's absolutely no such thing. And I know people, and I know people are looking for it. People would love it because they'd love to have their lousy philosophy and their wealth at the same time. But it's either or. We are not a social being. We're an individualistic being who likes other people and therefore we like to be social because we like it as individuals. So you start as an individual, you die as an individual, and you collect people around you that you hopefully love and you, engage, and, you, and you enjoy and you benefit from and you create a society to benefit you because it's in your self-interest. So no, I, I don't say to my wife every time thank you when she cooks me a meal, but I better be grateful and I better express that gratefulness in some way and there better be a lot of trading going on. You try having a relationship with somebody that's one way where you only, you're only a giver or you're only a receiver. How long will that relationship last? Nothing. Try doing it with a friend just for a few days. Only one directional. No. Every relationship. Now, capitalism deals with money. It deals with material goods. But life is the same principle just in spiritual goods. So often you don't have to say thank you to your wife. You give her a smile. A little nod. A little caress. There are lots of ways in which we trade, but these are trades. Again, if only you gave, you would feel cheated, and the person who constantly got would, would, would feel like they're not, you know, they're not participating, they're not worth anything. So everything we do in life that's healthy is an actual value-for-value value trade, spiritually and materially. So no, at the end of the day, Ayn Rand doesn't reject the idea that we're social, that we benefit from society. The contrary. She's not an individualist in the sense of going to desert island and living all by yourself. Right? That's not being egoistic in her concept because that's not maximizing the value you can get from life. Human beings are, present company included, wonderful. Human beings are fantastic. You want to have relationships with human beings. For whom? For you. So I think that we, we straw man her view and we have this confusion, individualism, this is individualistic. I do this because I love me more than I love you. I don't love you that much. I mean, I like you a little bit, but I don't know you that well. So how am I going to love you that much? Right? But I know I love me, but I love doing this and I'm hoping to change some of your minds. So that you become more productive and, and, you know, I learned something about Bitcoin that I didn't know before. I gained something, you gained something. We gained from the interaction. I love the attention these people, you know, they're focused, they're thinking. I love to see people thinking about ideas. It's great. And we're all benefiting. Each as an individual in a social context. All right. You're on. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Really Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.